The aurochs was the wild ancestor of the domestic cow. It's notable as the first example of humans, without any doubt, causing the extinction of an animal. The story of the aurochs begins in the Indian subcontinent around 2 million years ago. There was a species of cattle, which we have named Bos acutifrons. Beyond a fossil found in the Siwalik Hills, little is known about this species, but we think that it's the ancestor of the aurochs, which has been given the name Bos primigenius. Beginning in around 2 million BC, the aurochs spread out from India and throughout all of Eurasia over the course of around a million years. It reached the furthest extent of its range in Spain around 700,000 years ago. At their largest extent, before humans, they inhabited most of Europe and North Africa, the Middle East from the Levant to the Indian subcontinent, and parts of Central Asia, parts of modern China and Korea. Their range fluctuated over this 2 million year period with the coming and going of ice ages. As an ice age came, those to the north would migrate southwards or die out. As an ice age recessed, the northern, now milder climates would be replenished with an aurochs population. With the arrival of humans, the aurochs were probably hunted, but they weren't hunted in large enough numbers to significantly impact the population, as humans probably did with other megafauna. In Anatolia, around 10,500 years ago, these animals were domesticated, creating the modern species of cow, which we have named Bos taurus. Domesticated cattle were spread throughout Europe and the world by humans. With the wide adoption of agriculture and the expansion of the domestic cow, the aurochs population and range declined. Their story in the rest of Eurasia is difficult to track, but they disappeared in Europe slowly from west to east with the last male aurochs dying in 1620. The last female aurochs died in 1627. Part 1. Aurochs and their habitat. Even though the aurochs went extinct so comparatively recently, humans very quickly forgot about them. For the most part, people didn't know that they went extinct and believed that they could still be found in Poland well into the 18th century. The mistaken belief that they were still alive then meant that their existence was forgotten entirely and it was split between the domestic cow and the European bison. Historic accounts written referring to aurochs were thought to refer to the European bison. Aurochs bones were thought to be that of domestic cows. This lasted until 1827, when the study of a whole aurochs skeleton led to its classification as a different species. The aurochs was sexually dimorphic which means that male and female differed in their physical characteristics. All aurochs were born with a reddish-brown fur, but in males, this would turn a deep blackish brown within their first six months. They also developed a narrow, lighter strip on their back. Both male and female probably had lighter fur around their snouts. Their horns were lighter colours with dark tips. Sexual dimorphism is most apparent in their size. The largest of modern cattle measure 1.6 metres tall at the shoulders, with a more average measurement being around 1.4 metres. Male aurochs measured 1.8 metres at the shoulders, with females measuring 1.5 metres. This would have made the aurochs the largest herbivore in Europe and one of the largest herbivores on Earth. As well as their towering height, aurochs were notable for their horns. On females, the horns were between 40 and 70 centimetres long. On males, the smallest horns are 60 centimetres. The largest yet found in the Sutton Hoo burial in Britain is 107 centimetres. The shape of these horns varies, but only within certain margins. On average, the angle between the animal's forehead and its horn is 50 to 60 degrees, with the horns protruding forward. This tells us that the horns for both cows and bulls were actively used, both in competing for mates and in defending themselves from predators. Insect species and pollen remains tell us that the Europe to which humans arrived and in which aurochs thrived had a near omnipresence of forest. We can see this in their diet as well. Like most grazers, 
aurochs will have largely eaten grass. This grass was supplemented with leaves depending on the time of year. In spring and summer, lots of grass and not many leaves. In autumn, less grass and more leaves, but less food overall. In winter, an absence of both meant that they would begin to eat branches and tree bark. It's well documented that aurochs liked to eat acorns, and there's the possibility of their diet including fruits as well. Part 2 Humans and hunting. The earliest of European cave paintings include aurochs in the pictures. These date to around 30,000 years ago. More clearly, there are also paintings at Lascaux, also in southern France, which date to around 20,000 years ago. The humans that made these paintings were hunters. Their primary interest in the aurochs and in all wildlife would have been as prey. These cave paintings may reflect a form of worship of the aurochs. They may also have been a method to teach others about the correct way to hunt the animal, or more likely, both of these at the same time, as the act of worship and the act of hunting wouldn't need to be separated in the human imagination. Human societies developed agriculture, but they continued to appreciate the aurochs as a prize. Germanic society placed great importance on hunting as it was an activity through which people maintained their strength and prepared for war. Julius Caesar wrote briefly on Germanic culture and the aurochs interacting in the 1st century BC, saying of hunting them, the young men harden themselves with hunting the aurochs. They practice themselves in this kind of hunting, and those that have slain the greatest number of them, having produced the horns in public to serve as evidence, receive great praise. Of the horns in particular, we are told, these horns the Germanic people anxiously seek after and bind the tips with silver and use them as cups at their most sumptuous entertainments. Aurochs horns used as cups must have made great statements about the skill of a hunter or as the range of the aurochs recessed the skills of his ancestors. From the 6th or 7th centuries there have been aurochs horns found in Britain. These are only found in the most lavish of burials which reflects how they must have been perceived. Not least because aurochs were, as we'll discuss shortly, rather rare in Britain at this time, so these must have been family heirlooms which communicated the deeds of someone's ancestor. In Anglo-Saxon Britain, the name for the second rune of the Anglo-Frisian Futhor was Ur, meaning aurochs. The Old English rune poem tells us, The Ur is courageous and has huge horns, a very fierce beast, it fights with its horns. A notorious moorwalker. That is a brave creature. There's an obvious reference to the animal's horns, because this was the most well-known feature of these animals. But it's strange to refer to the Ur as a moorwalker, because we know that the aurochs was partial to living on grasslands, near to forests. Exposed moorland would be too out in the open for them. The only conclusion is that the poet was unfamiliar with the aurochs. They had almost certainly never seen one, and had no real idea where they would roam. But they understood it as a worthy prize for a hunter, and as mankind's adversary. It's described in heroic terms, as though describing Beowulf or Grendel. This is a good transition point into Part 3 – Domestication, Decline and Extinction We can be certain that the poet who wrote the Old English rune poem had never seen an aurochs, because by the time the poet wrote, the aurochs had been extinct in Britain for 2,500 years. When humans were hunter-gatherers, it could be said that the aurochs and humans were living in equilibrium. Humans hunted the aurochs, but not intensively enough to drive them to extinction. The aurochs managed to survive this new predator. But the dynamic was changed with farming. Instead of humans finding use in the forest to hunt wild game, they found themselves at odds with it. It was now necessary to clear forest to create more arable land for the farming of grains and crops. The details of how the aurochs was domesticated are unknown, but we can assume. For aurochs, the planted grain that humans had produced would be too great an opportunity to pass up. Aurochs could come in and eat the grain, being a literally titanic pest to farmers, just as elephants are for farmers today. Farmers would probably delight in having them killed so that the threat to their livelihoods was gone. But then there's also an opportunity presented. With a mixture of feeding the aurochs the surplus hay, 
and grains gained from farming, and trapping them to selectively breed them to be timid. Humans found a method to obtain the delicious beef and milk, and the useful hides and horns from the aurochs, without the effort of a hunt. By rearing the aurochs to be more passive, the domestic cow could gradually emerge. The recession of forests to the advancing march of grains planting, the emergence of pasture for domesticated cattle, the aurochs position as a great trophy kill for hunters, and its position as a gigantic pest for farmers. With these factors, it's no wonder that the aurochs gradually recessed. The aurochs first went extinct in Britain in around 1600 BC. Shortly after, it went extinct in the Middle East and in India, its range being driven westward. In Italy and Denmark, it went extinct in the 1st century BC and the 1st century AD. In the Netherlands, it went extinct in around 400 AD. Then, the aurochs disappeared in France, Hungary, Germany and Russia in the 13th century. This left the aurochs present only in modern Poland. Throughout the 14th century in Poland, aurochs are mentioned to be specifically exempted from hunting rights for all but kings. Still, the aurochs recessed, and around 1450, it could only be found southwest of modern Warsaw, in the forest of Jaktorów. In what was probably the first attempt to halt the extinction of an animal, there were several hunters employed by the king, whose job was to keep an eye on the aurochs, let them graze, collect hay from the subjects in Jaktorów to supply the aurochs with this in winter, to know the number of animals and provide a report to the district manager or the tenant every three months. Despite best efforts, what was initially a well-organised protection service eventually degenerated into a hollow, ineffective organisation as a result of negligence and corruption. The number of aurochs is difficult to ascertain as the reports begin to inflate their numbers to exaggerate success, but the 1564 report, taken to be somewhat accurate, mentions 38. With much of the forests destroyed, and competition from domestic cows, the numbers of aurochs continued to decline until eventually, in 1620, the last aurochs bull died. Recent DNA tests on this aurochs bull's horn revealed that it was already a crossbreed with the domestic cow. To local farmers, the area around where the aurochs were reserved was great foraging land, and the aurochs themselves were to them a nuisance, not only competing with their cattle, but clearly breeding with them as well. The last evaluation report, created in 1630, read, In the last report, it was written that there was one aurochs cow, but now the inhabitants of this village said that she died three years ago. This brings us to the 20th century. The Heck brothers, in Germany, made attempts to breed the aurochs back into existence in the 1920s, but these attempts were minimally successful at truly replicating the aurochs. The Heck cattle reflect more what the Heck brothers believed an aurochs looked like and acted like than what they were actually like. There are around 2,000 Heck cattle in Europe, which have been used as part of an attempt to make nature reserves more naturally wild, but with minimal success, as these are still domesticated cattle, disproportionately affected by winter, and they don't behave how aurochs used to behave. The loss of the aurochs is irreversible. This is where the story of the aurochs ends. Ultimately, the aurochs were adversarial to humanity's choices. From afar, it was seen as a notable kill to obtain, worthy, eventually, only of kings. But to people cursed with their presence, they were a nuisance, which made it harder to make a living. It's difficult to justify blaming individuals who simply want to improve their own lives for the extinction of the aurochs. But it's definitely a shame.